Ruth, or the Influences of Nature, W. Wordsworth. The loss of Ruth's mother before age seven and being left much to her own devices results in a wild child. She does grow up to the height of a woman, but never reaches the maturity that a caring community could have afforded her. The balance that happens in a life nurtured between freedom and overprotection, unfortunately, is not met for Ruth. We get only a surface look into the character of the vagrant. Native American folklore was very popular in Britain, and it was not uncommon for various impostors to pretend to be Indians for profit and or respect for the noble savage. The young man may have left the tumult of America on a journey to explore his own native roots, if they were African, i.e. Savannah. His tales of the Indians sound like they come from storybooks, not actual experience, or getting his own, i.e. picking strawberries, stories mixed up with what he had read or heard. Ruth, or the Influences of Nature. When Ruth was left half desolate, her father took another mate, and Ruth, not seven years old, a slighted child at her own will, went wandering over dale and hill, in thoughtless freedom bold. And she had made a pipe of straw, and music from that pipe could draw, like sounds of winds and floods, had built a bower upon the green, as if she from her birth had been an infant of the woods. Beneath her father's roof, alone, she seemed to live, her thoughts her own, herself her own delight, pleased with herself, nor sad nor gay, and passing thus the livelong day, she grew to woman's height. There came a youth from Georgia's shore, a military cask he wore, with splendid feathers dressed. He brought them from the Cherokees, the feathers nodded in the breeze, and made a gallant crest. From Indian blood you deem him sprung, but no, he spake the English tongue, and bore a soldier's name. And when America was free from battle and from jeopardy, he crossed the ocean came, with hues of genius on his cheek, in finest tones the youth could speak. While he was yet a boy, the moon, the glory of the sun, and streams that murmur as they run, had been his dearest joy. He was a lovely youth, I guess the panther in the wilderness was not so fair as he, and when he chose to sport and play, no dolphin ever was so gay upon the tropic sea. Among the Indians he had fought, and with him many tales he brought, of pleasure and of fear, such tales as told to any maid by such a youth in the green shade were perilous to hear. He told of girls a happy rout, who quit their fold with dance and shout, their pleasant Indian town, to gather strawberries all day long, returning with a choral song, when daylight is gone down. He speak of plants that hourly change their blossoms through a boundless range of intermingling hues. With budding, fading, faded flowers, they stand the wonder of the bowers from morn to evening dews. He told of the magnolia spread high as a cloud, high overhead, the cypress and her spire of flowers that with one scarlet gleam cover a hundred leagues, and seem to set the hills on fire. The youth of green savannas spake, and many an endless, endless lake. With all its fairy crowds of islands that together lie, as quietly as spots of sky among the evening clouds, how pleasant 
Then he said, It were a fisher or a hunter there, in sunshine or in shade, to wander with an easy mind, and build a household fire, and find a home in every glade. What days, and what bright years, ah me, our life were life indeed with thee, so passed in quiet bliss. And all the while, said he, to know that we were in a world of woe on such an earth as this. And then he sometimes interwove fond thoughts about the Father's love, for there, said he, are spun around the heart such tender ties that our own children to our eyes are dearer than the sun. Sweet Ruth, and could you go with me, my helpmate in the woods to be? or shed at night to rear, or run, my own adopted bride, a sylvan huntress at my side, and drive the flying deer, beloved Ruth? No more, he said. The wakeful Ruth at midnight shed a solitary tear. She thought again, and did agree with him to sail across the sea, and drive the flying deer. And now, as fitting is and right, we in the church our faith will plight. A husband and a wife, even so they did, and I may say that to sweet Ruth that happy day was more than human life. Her dream and vision did she sink, delighted all the while to think that on those lonesome floods and green savannas, she should share his board with lawful joy, and bear his name in the wild woods. But as you have before been told, this stripling, sport of gay and bold, and with his dancing crest, so beautiful through savage lands, had roamed about with vagrant bands of Indians in the west. The wind, the tempest roaring high, the tumult of a tropic sky, might well be dangerous food for him, a youth to whom was given so much of earth, so much of heaven, and such impetuous blood. Whatever in those climes he found, irregular in sight or sound, did to his mind impart a kindred impulse, seemed allied to his own powers, and justified the workings of his heart. Nor less, to feed voluptuous thought, the beauteous forms of nature wrought, fair trees and gorgeous flowers. The breezes their own languor lent, the stars had feelings which they sent into those favoured bowers. Yet, in his worst pursuits, I ween that sometimes there did intervene pure hopes of high intent, for passions linked to forms so fair, and stately needs must have their share of noble sentiment. But ill he lived, much evil saw, with men to whom no better law, no better life was known. Deliberately and undeceived, those wild men's vices he received, and gave them back his own. His genius and his moral frame were thus impaired, and he became the slave of low desires. A man who without self-control would seek what the degraded soul unworthily admires. And yet, he with no feigned delight, had wooed the maiden day and night, had loved her night and morn. What could he less than love a maid, whose heart with so much nature played, so kind and so forlorn. Sometimes, most earnestly, he said, O oh, Ruth, I have been worse than dead. False thoughts, thoughts bold and vain, encompassed me on every side, when I, in confidence and pride, had crossed the Atlantic main. Before me shone a glorious world, fresh as a banner bright, unfurled, to music suddenly. I looked upon those hills and plains, and seemed as if let loose from chains to live at liberty. No more of this, for now by thee 
Dear Ruth, more happily set free. With nobler zeal I burn. My soul from darkness is released, like the whole sky when to the east the morning doth return. Full soon that better mind was gone, no hope, no wish remained, not one. They stirred him now no more, new objects did new pleasure give, and once again he wished to live, as lawless as before. Meanwhile, as thus with him it fared, they for the voyage were prepared, and went to the seashore. But when they thither came, the youth deserted his poor bride, and Ruth could never find him more. God help thee, Ruth, such pains she had, that she in half a year was mad, and in a prison housed. And there, with many a doleful song, made of wild words, a cup of wrong, she fearfully caroused. Yet sometimes milder hours she knew, nor wanted sun, nor rain, nor dew, nor pastimes of the May. They all were with her in her cell, and a clear brook with cheerful knell did o'er the pebbles play. When Ruth three seasons thus had lain, there came a respite to her pain. She from her prison fled. But of the vagrant nun took thought, and where it liked her best, she sought her shelter and her bread. Among the fields she breathed again the master current of her brain. Ran permanent and free, and coming to the banks of Tone, there did she rest and dwell alone under the greenwood tree. The engines of her pain, the tools that shaped her soil, rocks and pools, and airs that gently stir, the vernal leaves, she loved them still, nor ever taxed them with the ill which had been done to her. A barn her winter bed supplies, but till the warmth of summer skies and summer days is gone, and all do in this tale agree. She sleeps beneath the greenwood tree, and other home hath none. An innocent life yet far astray, and Ruth will long before her day be broken down and old. Sore aches she needs must have, but less of mind than body's wretchedness from damp and rain and cold. If she is pressed by want of food, she from her dwelling in the wood repairs to our roadside, and there she begs at one steep place, where up and down with easy pace the horsemen travellers ride. That olden pipe of hers is mute or thrown away, but with the flute her loneliness she cheers. This flute, made of a hemlock stalk, at evening in his homeward walk, the Quantock woodman hears. I too have passed her on the hills, setting her little water mills. By spouts and fountains wild, such small machinery as she turned, ere she had wept, ere she had mourned, a young and happy child. Farewell, and when thy days are told, ill-fated Ruth, in hallowed mould, thy corpse shall buried be. For thee a funeral bell shall ring, and all the congregation sing a Christian song for thee.